Welcome everyone. Hello everyone, I'm Chelsea Lake and I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times throughout all of which we strive to bring you the authors and books we all love to the Politics and Prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link which I'll be putting in the chat to purchase Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family on the Politics and Prose website. Additionally, you can ask our author, Robert Kolker, a question by clicking on the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To ac access captions, click on the live transcript option. Just look for the CC image at the bottom of your screen. Finally, we thank you all for being with us here today. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Robert Kolker is the New York Times bestselling author of Lost Girls, named one of the New York Times 100 notable books and one of Publisher Weekly, Publishers Weekly's top 10 books of 2013. He is a National Magazine Award finalist and recipient of the 2011 Harry Frank Guggenheim Award for Excellence in Criminal Justice Reporting from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Moderating the conversation this evening is Brittany Kerfoot, Politics and Prose Director of Events. Please join me in welcoming Robert to PMP Live. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And um, I wanna thank everyone at Politics and Prose for hosting this Zoom. It's been a wonderful year since the book came out in hardcover of Zooms, not a wonderful year in general, but of Zooms uh, where I've been able to um, talk about this extraordinary family and this medical mystery with, um, with readers. And I'm glad to be talking a little bit about it today. So tonight I'll talk for maybe no more than 10 minutes just to give everyone the lay of the land and talk a little bit about my experience writing this book and about the issues in the book that really were most challenging to me and that I found most important to talk about. And then I'll be talking with, uh, with Brittany from uh, Politics and Prose about the book some more. And of course, all throughout, you can, through the Q&A feature, uh, please submit your own questions and there'll be plenty of time at the end for Brittany and I to go through those and answer questions before um, the end of our time together. But I'll start just by talking about how I came to write the book. Um, I'm, you know, this is a medical mystery and it's about schizophrenia and it's about severe mental illness. It's also a family story. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a patient. I don't have severe mental illness in my uh, life story. I'm a writer, I'm a narrative journalist, a nonfiction author and magazine writer who, you know, has been in New York for, for uh, you know, for my entire career. I, um, I went to high school in the Washington area, not so far from uh, politics and prose. I grew up in Columbia, Maryland and went to Washington all the time. Um, as a kid, I loved writing and I was interested in journalism, but I really wasn't interested in it the way that most people in my generation were. Uh, most of them wanted to be investigative reporters, uh, you know, cover the White House, be Woodward and Bernstein, be a foreign correspondent, but I really came to that kind of ambition late. Um, I knew I liked to write, but I, I was, I think, afraid to be in a hyper-competitive journalism situation where I'd be in the White House pool yelling out questions. It just didn't seem to be what I wanted to do. In my 20s, I got my first reporting job for a little community weekly newspaper on the west side of Manhattan. And uh, that's where things really clicked for me. I find that I really connect best when I'm reporting on everyday people, on people who don't necessarily expect a lot of news coverage in their lives. Every week at this paper, we would return to the same people dealing with the same situations, whether they were fighting a new skyscraper or dealing with the crime problem on their block. It, it's, it was always a little bit of a soap opera. You always wondered what would happen next week to these people. And it had a narrative aspect to it, which I appreciated. And I found that I was comfortable walking in the shoes of certain people week after week after week. And I became fascinated by nonfiction storytelling, by narrative journalism or new journalism or long form journalism 
whatever you'd want to call it, that's what I wanted to do. And I began reading Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion and uh, you know, Michael Lewis and, and you know, developing models for what I wanted to do. My career really took shape at New York Magazine where I wrote feature stories and cover stories. And I spent 17 years there writing stories that required a lot of research and reporting, but at the end were narrative stories mostly about the interior lives of, of, of uh, I keep saying everyday people, but what I mean is not the mayor, not the, not a movie star, but, but you know, people who you would run into just over the course of your day. Um, I wanted to use exhaustive reporting to sort of lift the veil on a part of society that we would otherwise never see. So these weren't just, um, these, were, these were people who were going through something in a part of the world that we wouldn't know. Um, and that we would hopefully recognize the humanity in people we might never have considered before really quite like us. And I took this approach to my first book, which was Lost Girls. It came out uh, eight years ago. It's about an unsolved series of killings in Long Island. It was a murder mystery, but it was also a social issues book about five of the victims and their lives and what made them vulnerable. And in the end, Lost Girls was about five families, about their strife and their estrangements and their eternal bonds. And now, um, with Hidden Valley Road, I happened upon a way to explore that subject more deeply than I ever dreamed I'd be able to. Uh, so this is how I came to write Hidden Valley Road. In, in the spring of 2016, five years ago, a friend of mine introduced me to two sisters, Margaret Galvin Johnson and Lindsay Galvin Rauch. Now they're both in their 50s. They're the youngest siblings and the only girls in a family of 12 children. Of their 10 older brothers, six of them, they told me on the phone five years ago, uh, were diagnosed with schizophrenia. And the more they told me about their family, the more I couldn't believe what they were saying. It was really quite shocking. Their, their oldest brother tried to kill his wife before being sent to a state mental hospital more than 20 times over two decades. Another brother, Joseph, sent threatening letters to the president. Uh, another brother, Matt, believed that he was Paul McCartney. Peter once shattered the windows of the house right in front of his parents. And then the big tragedy of the family was that their son, Brian, shot his girlfriend and turned the gun on himself. There was a murder-suicide that really brought the family to its lowest point in the 1970s. And then the story continues. The sister started to tell me, again, all of this is on the first phone call, about how the second son in the family, Jim Galvin, sexually abused them both from the time they both were toddlers. There was a a tremendous amount of neglect and a lack of attention in this family strictly because of all the chaos going on made it hard to focus on what everybody needed, which was safety. I mean, all this in one family, I really couldn't imagine it. And I wondered how such a family could even pretend to stay together under such circumstances. I wondered why these sisters wouldn't have run away the first chance they got and never come back. But the sisters, when I spoke with them, showed me that they still really were very hopeful in their approach to life and they felt like there was an important story to tell here. They told me how each of them had found a way through the traumas of their childhood and they told me that their family has a scientific legacy, one that they uh, really needed a reporter's help to try and figure out exactly how extensive you know, their, their family's scientific reach was. But they knew basically that their family was so statistically unusual that they became one of the first families to be studied by the National Institute of Mental Health as part of the search for the genetic origins of schizophrenia. Uh, later on, I would talk to several of the researchers who actually analyzed the family's genetic material, and I learned that their DNA really helped form the cornerstone of genetic research into schizophrenia that continues today. The family hadn't known that yet when we talked five years ago. The, the sisters had wanted their family story told as a work of independent journalism. They believed that every member of the family, sick and well, would participate. And I have to admit, I was a little skeptical of that. I'm a reporter and I know about the medical privacy laws and no one has to be told um, uh, you know, how sensitive a subject mental illness can be. How, those of us who have it in our lives often find it too painful to discuss with other people. Um, I've come to believe as I've worked on this book that even more than autism or bipolar disorder or depression or Alzheimer's disease, Schizophrenia is something really uh, that people really have difficulty looking at directly or discussing explicitly. But the Galvin family was ready. Every single surviving Galvin family was, member was interviewed for this book. And uh, as I started to get to know them over the course of a year, 
uh, before working on this book full time, I started to see that what could be done here was something really unique and very special. Uh, I can think of a lot of wonderful and very moving personal memoirs about mental illness. And I can think of many eye-opening books about the science of mental illness, but to my knowledge, Hidden Valley Road is unique in that no nonfiction author really had tried before me to write a 360 degree full-scale narrative representing every single family member's point of view. It was really an intimidating prospect, but a challenging one, and I started to get excited about it. And uh, a year later, after I first met them in the summer of 2017, I started to work full-time on the book. I structured the book as a family story, um, not as a case study, not as a dry science story, but as a family story. I start with the parents, Don and Mimi Galvin, marrying during World War II, moving to Colorado and raising their family. It wasn't lost on me that the dozen children in the family perfectly spanned the baby boom. Donald was born in 1945 and Lindsay, the youngest, was born in 1965. Their century was the American century, filled with optimism, at least in the early years. And you start to see some warning signs that something is amiss, uh, but the parents really have no preparation for what happens next. The kids first start to have their psychotic breaks in the late 60s, and then years later, the decisions the Galvin parents made when all is well and all is not so well become reevaluated by the children later on. The biggest challenge, I think, for the, me in this book was to portray mental illness accurately, perhaps in a way that hadn't been tried in nonfiction in recent years. I believe our popular culture has a way of othering the mentally ill in both low and high ways. Sometimes the mentally ill people in books and movies, fiction and nonfiction are, are monsters. And sometimes they are vulnerable, precious, helpless souls who have a special insight that the rest of us lack access to. And I don't think, I don't think people, those of us who have had personal exposure to people with severe mental illness really think those people are either of those models. Um, they don't really check off the either of those boxes. They're not the monster and they're not the misunderstood secret mystic. And so I thought, what if I wrote a family story about six mentally ill children and wrote about the mentally ill children the same way that I wrote about the non-mentally ill children, like they were people. And it turned out that happened to be, you know, quite the right way to go. I mean, I had a lot of poignant visits with the surviving mentally ill sons. And I saw how Donald has an air of peace about him these days as he talks about his family in fanciful terms and talks about being descended from an octopus. He sort of goes in and out of lucidity and talks about actual people and then goes into fantasy. And I saw how Matt is sort of grouchy and also lovable and grateful for all the help he receives. And I saw how Peter is sort of a natural performer and plays the recorder for everyone and and again, has great affection for the family members who come to visit with him. Spending time with them helped me understand that mental illness is not a cookie cutter condition and that uh, even people in the same family can manifest it differently. And this is where uh, the second challenge of the book really came into play. These brothers each suffered differently. And in discussing their illnesses, I really felt the need to weave in a sort of shadow history of the evolving science of mental illness throughout the 20th century. The only way to really understand this family's contribution to science was to understand the science itself. But the last thing I wanted to do was for this to be a dry textbook where I was forcing people to eat their vegetables. So I wanted this story to really come alive for readers and to really raise the stakes of the family's story. And it's not a pretty story, the science of schizophrenia. It's about, in the 20th century, it's about lobotomies and about researchers working in silos and not listening to one another and about theoreticians clashing with one another and slowing down progress by sticking to their guns and not co cooperating with each other. Uh, and I cover a lot of ground in the book. I talk about Freud and Jung and I talk about that period in the middle of the century where psychotherapists were blaming mothers for everything. And I talk about the anti-psychiatry movement in the 60s and 70s. And then I get into the genetic age today and in particular with the genetic age, I talk about the Galvin family's contributions. There are actual encouraging potential breakthroughs in research that are conducted by researchers whose work began decades ago with their studies of the Galvin family. All of this science is meant to work in service to the story of the family. And I write about how the children who did not become mentally ill were in many respects as affected as their brothers, how they sometimes felt as if they were carrying an unstable element inside themselves 
they wondered how much longer before it would get to them too. And as I follow these people from their childhood into the, well into their adulthood, I see how they have searched for ways to cope. And we learn about them all. And through it all, the two sisters who I first met, Margaret and Lindsay, are kind of our mainstays. And by holding on to them, we have that center to guide us and sustain us. And we learn about their relationship to one another and their very different ways of processing everything that happened. I feel like we can all relate to this. My feelings and memories about my family are not identical to those of my sister or my brother. Uh, we all carry our own truths within us, stories we tell ourselves to keep on going and to make sense of the past and to justify our lives. And Hidden Valley Road, I think, is a chance to see how one family under extreme pressure processes these memories in order to go on, in order to survive. I think that's a pretty good stopping point. And um, I can kick things over to Brittany now, and I'm happy to talk more with her and to um, take your questions as well. Yeah, I see there are already some great questions in the Q&A section. So people are so enthusiastic about this, which I love. But keep submitting your questions. We'll get to them soon. OK, so the first question I have to ask you, and I asked this question when I first started at Politics and Prose. I asked Lauren Groff when Barack Obama chose Fates and Furies as one of his favorite books of the year a few years ago. So where were you when you found out that Obama chose Hidden Valley Road as one of his favorite books of the year? And what was your reaction? Um, I was right on that couch <laughs> um, and my phone burped and um, this is embarrassing, but my wife and I, we have two teenage kids and we have a family Slack channel in order to, so we don't get up our, our butts and talk to each other. We actually Slack each other. During the day. <laughs> and my wife went on the family Slack channel and she said, your father's book has just been selected by Barack Obama as one of his favorite books of the year. And I don't, I really didn't leave the couch for hours. I, I found I couldn't, I was really dizzy and couldn't get up off the couch and walk around. I was just blown away by that. I really couldn't believe That's it. That's fair. <laughs> I think I would do the same thing. <laughs> um, so the, the mother and father in this story, um, Don and Mimi Galvin, they had 12 children. Um, why do you think they had so many children? It's, um, it's a question I try and tackle a lot of different ways in the middle of the book as the family keeps expanding because it's not a natural choice for them. They were Catholic, it's true, but it's not like anyone else in their family was having this many children. And so the in-laws were piping up you know, as more and more kids were being born saying, what, what's going on here? Why are you doing this? And it could be that um, that Donald, the father, was just highly invested in being this, you know, paterfamilias, this big shot and really wanted a big family. It could be that it could be that um, Mimi was really eager to please him because she was really quite dependent on him, having been dragged across the country to Colorado to start a family and to live. She really was quite alone out there. Um, some readers afterward have suggested to me that maybe Mimi was competing with Don, that having more children gave her sort of more clout in the family, a higher status. And having met Mimi, I could say that that's certainly plausible. She was a, a formidable person with an amazing intellect who, like a lot of people in her generation, had quit college to get married and have children. And so to suddenly be brought to a place she never really wanted to live kind of put her in a position of not even knowing who she was anymore. There's also a question of the kind of traumas that she had had in her own childhood and how she might be trying to create a whole new story for herself, a whole new family, a whole new set of company, a, a new way of thinking about herself, not as the, the child who, who with so many disappointments, but as the mother of 12 children. You know, she had her recipes published in the paper. She was, she was, even in her 90s, she was saying to me in interviews that they were once a model family and that people used them as an example. And so she was invested in it as well. So, so I feel like there was both spoken and unspoken reasons why, why they did it. So speaking of Mimi, she is a very complex character. I mean, a lot of them are, um, but her in particular, do you have a, a specific take on her? Like anything that you want people to know that maybe wasn't completely in the book? It, to me, I, um, I feel like the, the first part of the book is a little hard on her. It's a little tough on her because as children, the, they really, many of them were put in harm's way based on decisions that the parents made. 
and um, the mother being the domestic leader of the house was the one making a lot of these decisions because the father was off earning a living. And so it's on her, any mistake that's made is on her. And yet the family stays together through this time when anyone else it might've you know, completely collapsed or, or um, gone to pieces. And so it, there's, um, there are just two ways of thinking about it. And I witnessed that all the time in interviews with the children. My first interviews with the sisters, the first things they said were very critical of their mother. Um, like, oh, she had a lot of denial. She didn't believe that it was as bad as it was. She wouldn't talk about any bad news. We weren't allowed to talk about bad things happening because, you know, we couldn't complain because she would just say, you think you have troubles? What about your brother? Mm -hmm. um, they were very critical. But then the more I talked to them over years, the more I would see the subtleties in there. They would appreciate that their mother was able to do certain things that, that no one else was able to do. They also appreciated how limited her options were back then in terms of what medical care, what psychiatric care really was being offered because some of it was about warehousing the kids, others about it was about blaming her they were pumping people through full of Thorazine in a really reckless way back then. And that was bad for them as well. So she didn't have good options either. And of course, there was no way she could have anticipated that six of her 12 children would end up having the same condition. So, you know, no one wakes up in the morning thinking that's going to happen. So, so they, they, they were of two minds about it as well. And I, I like to hear from readers what they think of her, because I do think their things start to get broadened in that second part of the book as the children get older and start to reevaluate what their mother did and didn't do, they don't necessarily forgive everything about her, but they do acknowledge ways that she was very effective and helpful to some of the children who really needed the most help. And that, that makes her very complicated in my opinion. It's especially tricky because of all the mother blaming that goes on, right? Like in, in the schizophrenogenic mother, is like a cousin of the refrigerator mother that you hear about with autism. It's the mothers were getting blamed for everything back then. And so you can, you can criticize Mimi, but you can't blame her for schizophrenia necessarily. And so you have to stop at some point and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe she did some bad things, but maybe she was able to do some good things as well. Yeah, I mean, I am not a parent, but I can't fathom a, having 12 children in general, and B, having six of them be diagnosed. Well, they weren't even diagnosed because nobody really knew what it was, but this like mysterious thing is happening to half of your family. Um, I mean, I can't imagine how I would cope with that. It, probably not well. <laughs> so um, this, I'm sure a lot of people watching have read the book, but if you haven't, this certainly isn't like a beach read, right? This is not like the easiest book to just breeze through. And I found myself really conflicted with a lot of the family members. Um, you write with a lot of compassion for these people, but some of them ended up committing some really terrible acts. Um, there was animal abuse, there was the murder-suicide, there were, you know, threats and other violence. Um, how did you keep the humanity in focus um, the way you did, even when the reader might feel really angry at these people um, sometimes and maybe even dislike them for the things that they do. I guess my first job was to make sure that it wasn't, uh, that that the, the book wasn't all about the blood and guts, you know, that, that it wasn't a, gonna be an experience in rubbernecking um, or voyeurism of like, and then this bad thing happened and then that bad thing happened. My, my job was sort of to look at the, look at the ripples in the water about, about what, what once the bad thing happened, what happened next and then what happened after that and what, how did that change the family and what six ways did it change the family? And um, then I go back in time and I look at the person on their way to coming to that moment. Like for instance, you know, Donald with, you know, torturing an animal and then eventually almost harming his wife before being taken away to the mental hospital. I, I see years and years of years of untreated mental illness creeping up on him and him becoming more and more anxious. And I see a lot of anguish and a lot of anxiety among the mentally ill people before they be, before they have their psychotic breaks. And I, and I try to highlight that as well, because I, I think one interesting thing maybe we can get to later is about how these days, the Galvins would have, might have had a very different story because there is an emphasis on early intervention now in a way there certainly wasn't back then. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great segue to talk about if, I mean, this, this story takes place over the 1960s and 70s mostly. Um, and so let's, let's put the Galvins in the 2020s um, and imagine that, that you were writing a story about that kind of family. How would things be different for them? How has science changed in the last 40, 50, 60 years? Um, and how has society changed in their view of mental illness and schizophrenia in general? Because there's, there's quite a wide gap from when they were first showing signs to now. Well, um, I'll start by saying that there's a whole segment of society that, get, that, that, that just doesn't get great mental health care at all, and that there's a huge hospital to jail revolving door going on that also incorporates homelessness and, and um, law enforcement. And then, you know, it just, it's a, it's a mess. And that part of it is, is very discouraging. Um, in terms of the science, um, there really has been no new pharmaceutical drug for schizophrenia since the 50s or 60s. And that's stunning to me as well, because we live in this age where we look at mental illnesses as brain chemistry issues. And we, we think of all the new meds that have come online for anxiety or depression um, or bipolar disorder. And, and it's just not there for schizophrenia. So that part of it is really locked in place in a very frustrating way. On the other hand, um, we, there seems to be an understanding that schizophrenia is a developmental disease, which means that you're not born with it as a, which means it's first of all, that it's not immediately caused by the environment. It's not like uh, there's something in the water that's causing it. It's genetic. There might be environmental triggers, but in general, you're born with a predisposition, but you're also not born with the destiny of it. Like, there's no gene. We know now there's no one single gene that says, you're gonna have a psychotic break when you're 22 years old. Instead, what you have is a variety of genetic weaknesses or vulnerabilities. And somewhere in your life, things go astray um, because of those vulnerabilities. Something in the environment perhaps aggravates the situation for you, whether it's heartbreak or a head injury or, or drug use or, or, or something mundane like leaving home and going to college for the first time, it could be anything. Um, but that vulnerability is what people are now focusing on. And so the question then becomes two questions. First of all, it, what if the first time somebody has a psychotic break, we can get to them right away and intervene early when they're 17 years old, not when they're 25 years old. Um, and through a combination of minimal medication and aggressive therapy, help them become independent and functional enough not to have further psychotic breaks. This is like a night and day difference for, for the people who are suffering from this illness because um, the more psychotic breaks you have, the more damaged your brain becomes and the less functional you can be. So that's the first. And then the second one is science now is really aggressively looking at ways to make your brain more resilient from the moment you're born, or perhaps even when you're gestating in, in the uterus, when, when your mother could take a prenatal vitamin maybe that could, that could um, that could strengthen your brain and make it more resilient. And, and so even if you inherit a genetic vulnerability, you can move through it as your brain develops. That, that's the new great hope for, for the illness. And then the final thing that's different is family support. I mean, if you're, if any of, if you're lucky enough to have good medical care and you have like a 17 year old who's going through what Dom Galvin was going through, smashing dishes at the kitchen sink, you, you can go and get, uh, care from people who won't just care for him, but will care for the whole family, who will look at the family and, and find ways to support them as well through this moment. And that's really night and day between what the Galvins went through. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they didn't even really have a full name for it um, to, to even understand what was happening. Um, is there a prospect in the near future of schizophrenia being eliminated or some kind of cure being developed once it's diagnosed? Um, we're at the beginning of that in utero thing where you might be able to find ways to, to you know, hope that the, the, the Galvins very early on contributed to studies that then moved on to, to suggest that choline as, as a nutrient, as an enzyme, is something that expectant mothers could take and the AMA now recommends it for expectant mothers. So who knows, in a few years, it may be proven that it actually reduces the incidence of psychotic breaks in children, and that would be a game changer. But even if that 
is a failure, that, that essential strategy is really promising. Um, the other thing that's happening, I think, is that um, our conception of schizophrenia has changed. Um, it's, it's never been one illness. And um, it's not like COVID-19 that you could look at and point to it and say, yep, there it is, that's the disease. Schizophrenia is a classification. It's a word we use to, or diagnosticians use to help them treat people who have certain symptoms. But as we see with the Galvin family, even family members who all have what they call schizophrenia have wildly different symptoms. Some of them have delusions, other have others have hallucinations, and someone has catatonia, and someone has paranoia, and someone's really manic. It, it's just really, really different. And so we could reach a, a time not too long from now, a few decades from now, where we aren't using the word schizophrenia at all. And what we call schizophrenia now is actually 10 or 12 or six different brain disorders that can be discreetly diagnosed and each have, might have a different treatment. And that would, be, that would be a great thing in two ways. First of all, we'd be closer to treating it, but secondly, we'd be destigmatizing it and really taking schizophrenia away from the monster movie definition and, and back to and over to a, a brain disorder definition. Was, I mean, I know these people had more kids than most American families have, but is it, are they an anomaly in, in the, the sense that half of their children ha came down and had this disease? Um, or, or is it common and that it runs in the family that much? It could be that they, that there are so many schizophrenic children because they had so many children and that if they had four children, perhaps two of them would have had schizophrenia. It's very possible. They, there isn't quite enough known about the, how the genes work with this family. Um, the, the, um, the high numbers though, give you a lot of different samples to look at. And so you can see like, if there's a particular genetic variant or a mutation that, um, that all six of them have, um, then that really might actually cry out for study. And that's what, they, that's what they were thinking when they first went and got their genetic material back in the 80s. And it did yield some really interesting results. Um, we have so many good audience questions, so I'm gonna get to those in just a second. Um, but I do wanna ask about the two sisters um, that you talk to the most. And I know in the green room <clears throat> before the event, we were talking about how Lindsay is very much um, and an kind of an advocate now and a mental health, uh, activist, um, they, her and Margaret have very, ended up in very different places. They had very divergent paths. Um, can you talk a little about what it was like to talk to each of them and, and kind of why they ended up in such different places? I owe them both so much gratitude. And I actually, I can see on the, as you were talking, I went and looked at the participant list on the Zoom and I see Lindsay is on here. So hello, I'll say a shout out to Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Uh, um, they're very different people. For many different, for many many years, they really helped each other tremendously because their childhoods had so much in common. They went through so much and really needed one another to unpack what was going on. But they found different ways to process that trauma, and that becomes kind of a bonus for readers because they can look and see um, the pros and cons of each approach. And um, my job was not to referee or be or choose one over the other, but to sort of, you know set it up so that so that everyone could see how how that went. Um, Margaret really had been thinking about trying to write this family story for decades, but um, in the end uh, decided it needed an, an impartial eye and a reporter to really interview family members in a in a more effective way. But I, I you know not only do I personally owe her a great deal of gratitude to bring this vision forward, but I think she's really to be credited with a lot of the heart of, of the book because um, you get to see exactly the emotional toll that a lot of this took on the family based on a lot of what her observations were. And Lindsay, in terms of finding the medical records for the family members, for sick family members was crucial. And not only that, she also um, is the one who has been most deeply uh, involved in the care of the sick siblings, not just recently, but for all time, like since the 80s. And, and so her insight into the mentally ill brothers, it, it was, was more than crucial, it makes the book. And, and so 
it, it's amazing to um, be able to get those two perspectives and, and then the perspectives of everyone else and then whip it all together. That, that became my job over time. For the six remaining children who did not have schizophrenia, um, have they kind of come to terms? Is there any kind of um, like a survivor's guilt or do they worry that maybe one day symptoms will show up? Um, do they kind of feel like they have to look over their shoulder a little bit? How are they coping? Um, it, I do feel, and this is just my personal observation, that that the one thing that the the well siblings all share is a certain hypervigilance. Um, and it's not something you would notice if you just met them at the supermarket and were chatting with them for a few minutes. It's not that there's nothing I don't think that they share that would 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 jump out that way. But I think like you can't have a traumatic childhood like this with kind of one, particularly one where people who are so close to you are becoming seriously ill one after another without wondering what might happen next. And so they they each have a, a certain they're kind of on their guard a little bit when you talk to them. But that said, they're all very different people in other ways. And um, that part of that was what made it such an enriching and rewarding experience interviewing the family because everybody kind of sees it, the family in a slightly different way. You know, one I'll talk to one person one day who's saying, I don't like how authoritarian mom and dad were. And then I'll talk to another, you know, Galvin's son you know, a few weeks later, and they would say, you know, mom and dad were the salt of the earth. They were, you know, they were so loving and wonderful with us. And so you then you start to dig a little bit deeper and you see where things overlap and you reconstruct events based on everybody's memories. That, that part of it was um, that a wonderful and exciting thing to do as a, as a narrative journalist. I want to take some of these audience questions because there are so many. Um, we'll start with Sarah Walsh. She says, what was the most surprising part of working with this family? Um, well, at, at first I thought the sister, that it would be a story about the sisters um, and how, how they, it was them against the world and that they really shared their approach and how they helped one another. And they did help one another, but then their story got more complex. And start, as I started to talk to each of them separately, I started to learn just how different they were. And that at first really stunned me. And I thought, well, well, what's this about? And then I thought, realized how much more real that is. I mean, how much that's that's the way things are in so many of our families. And so I thought, uh, well, th this is a, a tremendous opportunity. So that was one big surprise. I think um, another surprise was how how generous Mimi Galvin was, the mother in the family. She passed away in the middle of my reporting on the book, but. Um, I, what I understood was that she was really not terribly interested in having her life story told or the, or the family story told um, until shortly before I came on the scene. And I guess she was a little bit um, energized by some of the new scientific information about the family that had come out because it pointed away from her as the culprit. It, it made it clear that she, you know, that bad parenting doesn't cause schizophrenia, that genetics does. And so she was a little bit more at ease. And so I was, I was really happy with how generous she was with her time and how, how willing she was to talk with me. She, I got on the phone with her and she starts talking about Long Island with me, which is where my last book is set and talking, you know, clearly she had, you know, at age 90 had done some research on me. It was kind of exciting that way to meet, meet her and get to know her. Yeah, and I know she was blamed for so much back then um, either you overparented or you underparented, and, and you know, women and mothers were seen in a very different light than they are now. And again, I just can't imagine the pressure of feeling like this is all your fault, um, that it's something that you did or could have prevented or done differently. Um, that that would be crushing. Yeah, and it's a bit of a red herring in the book in terms of the in terms of a plot device because because she's an aggressive parent, and so is Don. So is her. Her husband, they 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 really feel that staying on top of the kids and making sure that everything goes well and being quite regimented and demanding and giving everyone chores and teaching the kids to identify mushrooms at an early age and making sure everyone has music lessons and really pushing the family's excellence forward and having this kind of von Trapp family mm -hmm. style life that this is what they were going to do. And so then you look at that and you look at the schizophrenogenic mother theory and you think. 
this poor woman was a sitting duck. I mean, there were going to be inevitably a number of therapists who would look at her and look at this family and they, you know, look at the family on the cover of that book and they're matching clothes. And the therapist would have said, well, what, a, what kind of number did the mother put on those kids? And that's, mm -hmm. that's not what happened. And so it, 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 I sort of set all that up in the first part of the book and try and pick it apart from that point forward. Um, Amanda's question is, some of the Galvin members were deceased by the time you worked on this book and you had more access to people like Margaret and Lindsay. Given those constraints, can you talk about the reporting and decision-making process that went into how much you wrote about or profiled each member of the family? Um, the, the sisters end up becoming foregrounded and so does Mimi, I think. And I think at some point Donald Galvin, who is still alive but is mentally ill, because there are so many greatly detailed medical records about him from, from teenage years up and you know, and through the present, he becomes a very fleshed out character as well. Um, I think I, I had to decide early on that it, since there were 12 children and two parents that certain people would have to be foregrounded and that others would have to be sort of satellites who would sort of orbit in and around and job in and out. And that way the reader would, would, be, would have people to hang on to who, even if it, there was a, a chapter about Michael Galvin going off to join a uh, commune and everything you learned at the commune, the reader in the back of her mind could say, well, it's cool. I, I know I'm gonna get back to Lindsay and Margaret sooner or later. This is just an interesting uh, other thing that's happened to another Galvin family member. So I thought it would make it, it did two things. It made it manageable and it also um, helped give you kind of some kind of an emotional entryway into the family by looking at the two girls and what they went through. Um, but it also was out of necessity. I mean. Jim Galvin, who's a, you know, such an atrocious figure, like such a, he, he sexually abuses the sisters. There aren't a lot of medical records for him. He, he just went, he didn't go to the public hospital as, um, as often as the other brothers did. And so he went to places that destroyed their records. And so you kind of go with what you've got in these situations, but it would have been wonderful to have learned more about his medical care. And instead, I just have a little bit from a doctor who treated him enough to go on, but not enough to really um, have the deepest understanding. Yeah. There are a couple questions about um, the symptoms, so I'll kind of combine them. Nancy wants to know if there are any symptoms that are seen in the next generation of the family. Um, and then Carolyn asks if all of the children exhibited their mental health problems around the same age. Um, in general, schizophrenia is supposed to show up at the end of adolescence, so late teens, early 20s, and that's the, the pattern this family really followed. I mean, Peter was 14, but everybody else is sort of 17 to 22, 23, 24. And, um, and so they're really by the book in, in that sense. Um, uh, the, the initial question there was about, about what the symptoms are or what the... Um, if there were any that have been seen in any... Future. Oh, the next generation. Yes. So I kind of, I try to, I try to capture the, the family's vigilance in looking at the next generation toward the end of the book by talking about Lindsay's kids, but they sort of are stand-ins for everybody in the family and the next generations. I think everybody has their eyes open looking for something and they want to step in and help if, if they see something happening and try and get early intervention for them. And so far, I'm not aware in that generation of any major calamity, um, which is great news. And I guess the, the geneticists who have looked at the family are not surprised that that's the case. They said that, that just because there's a, a genetic mixture between Don and Mimi Galvin that creates certain mutations for this generation doesn't mean that it's a super gene that then goes directly to the next generation. It simply means that the vulnerability got amplified in this family of 14 or family of 12 kids and that the next time perhaps it wouldn't be you know it and that's the thing about schizophrenia it wanders and meanders through families genetically and and you don't quite see it coming and how could you not be hyper vigilant in a situation like that yeah absolutely 
Um, Megan wants to know, <clears throat> did any of the Galv Galvin siblings read the book before or after the release and what was their response? And I know we've talked about how Lindsay attends your events and she's a big mental health advocate, um, but what about any other members and not even just the siblings, but maybe even extended family? Um, I made sure all the siblings had a copy um, a few months before the publication date. Um, and that was good because there was a chance to make some, um, some corrections of fact, like, like um, geographical problems. You know, I'm a New Yorker in Colorado, I'm gonna be making mistakes like that. So there, that was good. And then there were also, um, there, there were moments where people are clashing with one another and one brother says something about somebody or one sister says something about another person and they had to sort of reconcile and, and and get used to the idea that it wasn't necessarily going to be um, a completely stage managed book that it was going that people were going to say things that you weren't necessarily ready for. But I think the most important thing was that they, and thank goodness this is the case, they all came away agreeing that this was not an exploitative book. It wasn't about uh, looking at the car crash and pointing and saying you've got to see this horrible thing. That they they saw that it was high minded and that it was intentioned well and meant to try to help people and um and and to also do a lot of work against the stigma you know so many families wouldn't have told this story and so i tried to make it clear to them from, from the beginning that they would really that there's something i think heroic in opening up this way and talking about um a family illness this way and i think that proved to be true i think we everybody kind of exhaled when the reviews came in and it was received so warmly. It was really overwhelming to me personally, but also a huge, I think, I, I'd like to think that it was a relief to the Galvins and that they felt good about that too. Did you have to do any convincing of anyone to, to talk to you? Um, and if you did, what did you, what did you say? That was the interesting thing. I thought that in the very beginning, I really was um, convinced that most of the family wouldn't want to talk to me. I said to myself, well, the sisters want to talk, but it can't possibly be true that others want to. But what I hadn't realized is that so many of the horrible things that happened in this family happened several decades ago. Mm -hmm. And also Mimi was up in years and was frail physically. So people thought time was running out for her. And the sisters were together in this, in this idea that the book should happen. And so between all of those things, the brothers all kind of, um, said all right they said they, they deferred to the sisters they said well if the sisters want it then let's that's that's fine and if mimi the mother's okay with it then it's all right that doesn't mean that they were all the easiest interviews in the world but i don't i was never turned down for an interview they all were really happy to meet up with me you know some of them were quieter than others but they all were nice and um and they all and and i don't I can't remember a single time where I asked anybody in the immediate family a question and they said, actually, I'd prefer not to answer that. Like they all were ready to answer every question I put to them. And that was um, just a wonderful thing in terms of being able to get at something deeper going on in the family. That's kind of incredible that, that it was, that they were that, all of them were so open with you. I feel like that can be really rare, especially yeah, when I mean, was involved. Right. The challenge wasn't the challenge wasn't pulling teeth to get them to open up. The challenge was sometimes to listen to the um, what they were saying and and try to try to move past what initial um, family mythology that they were trying to that they had really subscribed to over many years. Like, oh, mom was a saint, or oh, mom was terrible. You know, whatever it was, I would listen to that for a very long time, and then we would get to talking, and then I would try and get at something a little more subtle about, about it and speak a little more real. Cause I think that's natural. Like I'm a stranger coming to talk to them. They're not, he's, they're not gonna sit down and go, okay, let me tell you what I really think. Instead, they're going to start with, uh, with, the, line, with, with the easy story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was, let me find this question. Oh, there are a couple people who um, have questions about the Galvin's falconry or bird watching hobby. Um, someone says, I thought that was very odd and very out of the, out of the ordinary. And they were wondering what you make of that. Um, I think that's exactly how the sisters characterized it on the phone that first, with that first phone call. 
I, I said, wow, that's that's wild. And they were like, yeah, it's pretty weird, isn't it? That, that this <laughs> happened. And they also were very, they were tickled by it because it's a bit of a, there's a bit of fame attached to it. The, the Air Force, you know, the, the, the Air Force's mascot is the Falcon because Don Galvin wrote a, wrote a letter to the Air Force as it was getting formed and said, the other armed services have a mascot, yours should be the Falcon. And it was his suggestion that took hold. And so they, and then he credited Mimi with having the idea of it. So the, the two of them together kind of named it. And then he flew Falcons for the Air Force. He was on national television at halftime, you know, flying birds. And so for a while there, that's what their family did. And the older siblings all went out, you know, uh, helping dad or perhaps even um, climbing and rappelling themselves and getting birds from nests. It was interesting in that sense. And it, there was an obvious metaphor to, to, to use and I used it, which is that this is, this, this is a New York couple that goes to Colorado and they're looking for something to do in their very little spare time. And they, it's not golf, you know, it's not, it's not sitting by the pool or, or joining a country club. It's something very strenuous, something very demanding, something that's linked to a noble uh, tradition. It makes them feel good about themselves and makes them feel special and distinctive. And it takes a lot of hard work. And if you work hard enough and do it all right, there's all sorts of cool rewards for it. And I think this is how they viewed life. And I think that's how a lot of people in the middle of the 20th century viewed life. If you worked hard enough, you know, they won the war. Like if you work hard enough and you, you are willing to give it your all, good things are going to happen to you. And then this becomes a story like so many stories where not everything happens as expected and where their people face really intense reversals that may not even be their fault. And how do they react when the worst happens? That, that, that's, I think, what I love about a, uh, about a lot of nonfiction books is you watch people dealing with adversity and you wonder, well, how would I be in that situation? Yeah. Uh, Jane Park wants to know, uh, the wealthy family that took Margaret in, did you spend much time with them and ask about their motivations for extracting this child the way they did? In some ways, it was both a blessing and not for Margaret. Yeah, they, they, are, they were super nice people and, and were very happy to meet with me. Um, this is Sam and Nancy Gary, and Sam is a, was a, um, a major philanthropist for many, many decades in Denver and um, really helped build up part of that city as a whole new neighborhood for the, to, the, to, and made it affordable, had a library named after him. And of course their medical philanthropy is enormous as well. Um, so this is just one little pizza slice of what they did as they helped out the Galvin family. And by the time I met them, Sam was kind of up in years and his memory wasn't so great. Nancy was a little younger and I talked with her at length they're, um, they are, are excellent philanthropists, but they, but it was not a, um, not an emotional conversation. You know, she would say, oh yes, I helped out the girls. The girls were very angry as teenagers that all this was happening to them. So she, and this is actually a mirror of her relationship with, with Mimi. They were ostensibly friends, but there was no real point where one of them would go to another's house and, you know, bring a, coffee cake and sit and the other one would cry and the, they would hold hands and talk about what to do that that wasn't their friendship the friendship was Nancy swooping in and saying looks like you need help I'll take Margaret send her to me and then then a whole new life is set in motion for Margaret and it's almost like out of Charles Dickens so it's it's kind of um but as as the questioner said, there there are nuances to what she experienced. She'll be forever grateful to for, to them, but she also felt um, disconnected from her family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there other books? I mean, I feel like Hidden Valley Road did so much for the stigma of mental illness and schizophrenia in general. It's something that not a lot of people know a lot about. Um, probably until reading this book, are there other books, similar books that you would recommend or ones that you read or just liked um, that people should read next after this one? Um, there are a few I love. Um, one is one is a collection of essays called The Collected Schizophrenias by mm -hmm. Esme Weijin Wang, and she she's terrific. And she, she really is coming at this from an entirely different area. She is mainly doing it for, uh, as a memoir, 
based on what she's been through, but she really brings a lot of wisdom and research in as well. She, it's, it's not just, it's not like girl interrupted. It's not, and then I did this and then I did that. It's really very insightful. And then there's another great memoir called The Center Cannot Hold by Ellen Sachs, which again is very different. This is a very high functioning person who had really acute psychosis. So she's able to really talk about what it feels like from the inside in a very insightful way. And her journey is pretty um, incredible. And she's just a, just a really sharp writer as well. And then there's a chapter on schizophrenia in, in Andrew Solomon's amazing book, Far From the Tree, which is really about all kinds of different parenting conundrums. Um, that's just a wonderful book in general that, that is like top of the line um, narrative nonfiction, but the schizophrenia part of it is pretty, pretty great. I feel like growing up, I grew up in the 90s and Prozac Nation was really like my Bible. It was the only thing I had, but it really helped me understand, even though that's such a heartbreaking book. But it's so great that um, that now more people are writing about it, whether it's uh, reported nonfiction or memoir. Um, and there are some really great books about mental health out there now that help people understand whether they're going through it or someone that they know is going through it. Um, the options aren't as limited anymore. Yeah, I mean, in my lifetime, bipolar disorder and anxiety and depression, um, they all stopped being taboo. You know, yeah. when, when I was little growing up, you wouldn't talk about, you know, or in autism, I would add autism to that list. I had a friend with an, a brother who was autistic and the family didn't talk about it. Now they would have talked about it morning, noon and night. And, right. um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that schizophrenia is happening that way as well, that it's poised to change. And I would love this book to be part of that. So last question, uh, you know, the paperback of Hidden Valley Road is out now. So you're, you're winding down with promoting this one. What are you working on next, if anything? Um, I, have, um, I have a magazine story I'm working on uh, for the Times Magazine that, that, that is, um, that, that I'm really, enjoying learning something new, you know, and going into something new about, I don't know whether it would be a book or not, but it's been fun. I've been writing a little bit about mental health on the occasion of the paperback for Medium. I've been, over the last year, I've learned some new things and talked to some people who I hadn't talked to before. And those ideas have been knocking around my head. So I, maybe I'll be a mental health blogger on and off in the future. And then I'd like for my next book to be also about families. I realized the last two were about about families and so I'd like to come at it from a different direction now perhaps write about a family estrangement I'm, I'm not sure exactly well you'll have to come back to us whenever the next one comes out <laughs> thank you anytime this yes, has been wonderful you. well yeah the hour flew by this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob and Brittany, both for joining us this evening. And thank you all for coming. Uh, your patronage is what enables us to bring you programming like this. So I hope you'll consider using the link in the chat to purchase Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family. Please visit our website for the most up-to-date event listings. We do hope to see you at another event soon. Take care and stay well, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks. Thanks to Politics Thanks, and Pro. Bye. Bye bye.